It was a fire like no other. A burning tower that would become a symbol that something in Britain had gone wrong. Nine months on, we've analyzed the events of the 14th of June in a way never done before, using this digital model of the Grenfell Tower. The team behind it is called Forensic Architecture, a group of academic researchers who investigate human rights violations across the world. This is their first project in the UK in collaboration with Sky News. They've used our TV footage from the night, witness testimony and mobile phone data to recreate what people would have seen and heard. Um, and this becomes the sort of base on which we can overlay uh, footage from uh, social media and from uh, news sites like yourself that have um, supplied us with footage um, so that we can then uh, understand in 3D space and in time as well um, what's happening and what unfolded in what order on the night. This digital timeline will cover eight hours of the fire, minute by minute. Researchers are collecting hundreds of stories of the night and asking the community for any material they have to make the model as detailed as possible. This will provide a unique and independent account, which forensic architecture say could be used in the public inquiry. We realised that this was an event unprecedented in British history and in London's history. And we resolved uh, that there must be a way that we could make a unique contribution to the public understanding of this catastrophe. This will be a, a historical tool. Um, this will be um, a tool that we hope will be the most complete publicly available record of the circumstances of the night of the fire. Um, and it's a record that will be built from all the publicly available information, information that uh, we hope and that we're asking the public will uh, share with us. One person with a powerful story to share is Jackie Haynes. She lives right next to the tower she has done for 40 years. She was outside that night and witnessed the flames engulf the building. When you watch it just go up in seconds, it, you know, it just didn't fit. It just didn't fit with what, what your mind knows should be happening. And then the people screaming and them realising that they couldn't get out and shouting through the windows, you know, waving their phones, screaming. And at one point we were standing on the lane and we saw two people just fly out of the window. Someone else watching in panic was 27-year-old Christopher. He'd been working late and returned home to Grenfell around 1am. He lived on the 10th floor of the tower with his father, Antonio, who was asleep inside. When I saw it the first time, I thought I'd already lost him. So that's why the reason I called him straight away. And he woke up like straight away, luckily. The tower had been home to Antonio for almost 30 years. He managed to survive in his flat for five hours, doing all he could to stay safe as the fire spread around him. The moment I opened the door, a lot of smoke came in, very hot, very, very strong, very dark, pitch dark. And I realized, hold on a second, here you're in, you're in big trouble. So I closed the door quickly, I went to the um, uh, bathroom and I rinsed my eyes a little bit. And then Christopher from downstairs, he sent me a picture of the tower burning. And it was not like a, a small uh, uh, fire, it was like the whole uh, side of the tower was burning. So. Uh, and then I said, OK, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, now you do the right thing, because if you do something wrong, you might not be able to get out of life. Above Antonio on the 22nd floor were the Shuker family. Nadia and her husband Bassem lived in flat 193 with their three children. Next door was Nadia's mother. They called 999 for help up to eight times and were told to stay inside. The whole family died that night. I lost my mother, my sister, my brother-in-law, and their kids, three kids. They were the best thing I ever had in my life. Fun. Sorry. The last contact Nabil had with his sister was a phone message at 2.41 in the morning. She said it was like to say goodbye. That's the way I've seen it now. It was a text message? Yeah. 
What did it say? Uh. Basically, it was saying, I in a bill, I'm in the tower, there's a fire. Just, you know, just want to say, because I was asleep at the time. Just want to say, it's me, Nadia, Nadia, you know. And that was it, basically. Nabil believes his family were caused further distress by a police helicopter used during the fire. This photograph shows his sister, Nadia, with a makeshift flag, waving for help as the fire raged. Nabil thinks the helicopter gave residents hope they were going to be rescued. He's made a formal complaint which the Metropolitan Police are investigating. They were deceived and it's, uh, it was unacceptable, you know, it's, what they were doing is, is not right. It shouldn't, they shouldn't have been there at the time. Perhaps most controversial that night, though, was the instruction by emergency services for residents to wait inside their flats. Antonio did stay put and he was saved, but he believes he was lucky. He was on a lower floor. He thinks those above him should have been told to leave. Nobody knew is that how fragile the outside of the building was and that the, 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 that the fire was spreading and, 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 and burning so quickly that in that case, especially the, the, the top floors, um, you know, it, it, you had to go out. You had to go out. If I had seen the fire, you know, coming towards me, if I had been in a, you know, on a top floor as well, um, okay, when you see this, it's, you know, it's, it's a dead trap. Sky News has learnt there were rooms on every floor of the tower that weren't damaged by the fire. Firefighters have told us these small rooms stored the bin shoes where residents got rid of their rubbish. They had a fire door but no windows and we've been told were untouched by smoke. The Metropolitan Police, who are in control of the tower while it remains a crime scene, refuse to comment while their investigation is ongoing. On the night of the fire, Antonio was one of the last people to leave the building alive. He was finally rescued at 6.30 in the morning. I was um, leaning my elbow onto the handrail so I, because I could not see anything. Don't forget that I was totally blind uh, because of the towel that I had on me. And uh, so basically, you know, we went down very well synchronized and as we reached the lower part of the tower, then I could hear uh, voices. And uh, in no time, we were downstairs. A lot, I remember lots of people. For everyone who experienced the horror of that night, getting transparency and the truth is vital. It's our neighbours, it's our friends, you know, people who we've known long enough to be, fam to be like family. And that, that's why it was the whole estate that felt it that day. It wasn't just the tower burning, it was we are on fire. 71 people lost their lives in the Grenfell Tower fire and hundreds of others were left homeless. Antonio and Christopher have now moved out of a hotel and into temporary accommodation. Appreciating the simple things they've missed. Okay, enjoy your night. But like all those affected by the fire, the most pressing concern is getting the answers they need and making sure a tragedy like Grenfell never happens again. They must come up with the proper answer and they must come up with, um, with justice. We need to stand up for ourselves and we need to make sure that we're not just left to live in vulnerable, unsafe conditions. We have to stand up now. I want to make sure that they never forgot, that they always remembered forever. <laughs>